Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for being here with us today. We welcome you. My name is also Toya. I'm a lay member of the, of the Judicial Council from the Liberia Annual Conference, West Africa. I have the honor of serving as the president of the Judicial Council of United Methodist Church for the current quadrennium. It's my privilege to welcome you this morning to this oral hearing on the matter that is before the Judicial Council as docket item number 05181, which is a petition from the Council of Bishops requesting the Council to issue a declaratory decision as to the meaning, application, and effect of paragraph 14 in relation to paragraph 1507 of the 2016 Book of Discipline. Before offering any comments on the specific details of this oral hearing, I will offer a few general comments about the nature of this meeting and of the body that is seated before you. The Judicial Council is a constitutional entity established by the United Methodist Church for the governance of the denomination. It exists by virtue of Division 4, Article 1 of the Church's Constitution. Its authority is aligned in six specifications of Division 4, Article 2. And its decision, according to Division 4, Article 3 of the Constitution, are final. The nine members of the Judicial Council are elected by the General Conference to terms of eight years. In the current quadrennium, there are four clergy and five lay members. At times, the Council is called the Supreme Court of the United Methodist Church. And in fact, we must admit, there are some similarities to it in Supreme Courts around the world. Its, it, its decisions are founder. It has the authority to declare the legislative action by another part of the government unconstitutional. But there are many differences. One important difference is that the Supreme Courts, that in Supreme Courts, there are no alternates seated in members of the court, either recused from a case or are not able to participate in a matter for reasons su such as illness. For the Judicial Council, the church has provided a system whereby alternates may be seated when members of the council cannot attend. A clergy alternate is seated in place of a clergy member, and a lay alternate is seated in place of a lay member of the council, should that circumstance occur. In the matter immediately before us, such a circumstance has occurred. A lay member of the Judicial Council, Denel Taka, is not with us. A lay alternate, Warren Plodden, will participate in this oral hearing. Surely I will ask the members of the Judicial Council to introduce themselves. But before doing so, I will outline the procedures for this oral hearing. According to the rules and practice of the Judicial Council, requests for oral hearings may be approved at the discretion of the President of the Council. In fact, most matters before the Judicial Council do not include oral hearings, and not all the requests for them are granted. For this oral hearing, we have three parties making presentations. We have the petitioner, which is the Council of Bishops, the respondent, which is the General Commission on the, on the General Conference, and Embassy Courier. The petitioner, the Council of Bishops, will have up to 20 minutes to present this argument. Normally, in an oral hearing, the opposing side will have the same amount of time, except for the fact that, it, that the petitioner may express a desire to reserve five minutes of the allotted time for rebuttal, if that desire is made known at the end of the petitioner's representation. The Amherst Courier have been allotted 30 minutes to present their various arguments. There are five. Each of them will have six minutes to present his or her argument. There will be no yielding of time by an Courier. After the parties have concluded their presentation, the members of the Judicial Council may pose questions to the parties. We will strive to be good stewards of our time in asking questions, and we hope you will likewise do so in your replies. We have allotted 
a maximum of one hour and 30 minutes for this oral hearing. We hope we stick to that. For transparency, in order to enable many members of our denomination to witness the oral hearing, the oral hearing is being live streamed. The oral hearing is a public event. By no time does the Judicial Council permit comments from any person other than those who are authorized presenters on the matter. The presenting parties are to address the Judicial Council and not each other. This is the Council hearing, so you, you are speaking to us. All electronic devices should be turned off or silenced. Therefore, you, if you have an electronic dev device, this is the perfect time to reach into your pocket or purse and silence same. In conclusion, we recognize that there are literally tens of thousands of United Methodists around the world in prayer for this council. We give thanks for this prayerful support. I will now invite my colleagues to introduce themselves, beginning with the Vice President of the Judicial Council. Good morning. I'm Justice Rubenti Reyes, a retired member of the Supreme Court of the Philippines, lay member of the Judicial Council, now Vice President. Good morning. I'm Louis Tran, clergy member of uh, California Pacific Annual Conference. I'm also the Secretary of the Judicial Council. Good morning. I am Beth Capen, lay member and from the New York Annual Conference. Good morning. I'm Pastor Blackwell, the pastor of the Asbury Methodist Church in Woodland, New Jersey. And good morning. I'm Avin Heliason, clergy from Norway Annual Conference. Good morning. I'm Warren Plowden. I'm the Chancellor of the South Georgia Annual Conference, and I'm the first lay alternate. Good morning. I'm Lydia Gulel, lay member from the Mozambique Annual Conference. Thank you. Good morning. Kabamba Kiboko from the Democratic Republic of Congo. Uh, South Congo Episcopal Area, then Texas Conference, and now West Ohio Conference. Thank you. Thank you. I will now invite Reverend Louis Vultran, our secretary, to lead us in prayer. Almost exactly to the day, 280 years ago, the Reverend John Wesley made the following entry in his journal. In the evening, I went very unwillingly to a society in Aldersgate Street where one was reading Luther's preface to the epistle to the Romans about a quarter before nine while he was describing the change which God works in the heart through faith in Christ. I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt that the trust in Christ Christ alone for salvation. And an assurance was given me that he had taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. With the assurance of salvation through Christ, I invite you to join me now in an attitude of prayer. Gracious God, giver of life, we pray for the church throughout the world. Sanctify its life, renew its worship, empower its witness, and restore its unity. Remove from your people all pride and every prejudice that diminishes their will for unity. Strengthen the work of all those who strive to seek that common obedience that will bind us together. Heal the divisions which separate your children from one another, 
that they may keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Grant us, O Lord, sincerity, that we may persistently seek the things that endure, yes. refusing those which perish, yes. and that amid things vanishing and deceptive, we may see the truth steadily, follow the light faithfully, and grow ever richer in that love which is the life of all people. For we are convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. We now invite the practitioner of the Council of Bishops to the podium to present this argument. brief submitted to the Judicial Council. It is not my intention to repeat the detailed arguments. Rather, I intend to highlight the framework that I believe must inform the Judicial Council's decision. I will limit my initial comments to 15 minutes and respectfully request five minutes for rebuttal and closing comments. We are here today for this meeting of the Judicial Council because of the action of no other body than the 2016 General Conference itself. Faced yet again with intractable gridlock and an avalanche of conflicting petitions regarding human sexuality and the heightened conversation regarding schism, the 2016 General Conference took action to seek a proposal from the Council of Bishops on a way forward. When a pro proposal titled An Offering for a Way Forward was presented to the General Conference, the conference took action, and I quote, to accept the report from the Council of Bishops and act on the steps that they have proposed to move the United Methodist Church forward, end of quote. These steps included, among other items, deferring all votes on human sexuality pending before the 2016 General Conference, the Council of Bishops constituting and naming a commission, calling a special General Conference, and reporting back to the General Conference. But as significant as these specific steps, the report approved by the General Conference clearly stated that the role of the bishops, and I quote again, is to lead the church toward new behaviors, a new way of being, and new forms and structures which allow a unity of our mission of making disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world, while allowing for different expressions as a global church. Developing such new forms will require a concerted effort by all of us, and we, your bishops, commit ourselves to lead this effort." End of quote. The 2016 General Conference, as the supreme legislative body, acted within its constitutional authority to request and accept the bishop's proposal. It knew what it was doing. It was stopping the endless quadrennial cycle of legislative battles over human sexuality. It requested leadership from the council. It was asking for a concrete alternative plan for a way forward. In the opening paragraph of an offering for a way forward, the council stated, your bishops were honored to receive the request of the General Conference to help lead our United Methodist Church forward during this time of great crisis and great opportunity, and we accept this request with humility. This spirit of honor, humility, and servanthood has defined the work of the Council of Bishops over the past two years. 
The Council of Bishops understands it is in the service of the General Conference. The Commission was guided by a mission statement that concluded with the following affirmation, and again I quote from that document, the work is meant to inform deliberation across the whole church and to help the Council of Bishops in their service to the next General Conference in finding a way forward. It was in this spirit of service to the General Conference that the Council of Bishops issued a call on April 24, 2017 for a special session of the General Conference that is limited in scope and aligned with the clearly expressed intent of the 2016 General Conference. It is clear the Council of Bishops has the constitutional authority to call a special session and to state a limited purpose for such special session. It was in this spirit, the same spirit of service to the General Conference, the Council of Bishops voted on February 28, 2018 to petition the Judicial Council for a declaratory decision on the meaning, application, effect, and effect of paragraph 14 of the Constitution in relationship to the diversity and global nature of the United Methodist Church, and two, to assist the delegates to the 2019 Special General Conference to take informed action on the recommendations. At every step along this two-year process, the General Conference, by minimizing obstructions and distractions and fulfilling the, in, the in, intent of the 2016 General Conference to focus, excuse me, the 2016 General Conference to focus on a report conference chancellors and the brief filed by Ms. Stephanie Henry eloquently and accurately contend that paragraph 14 and paragraph 507 are not on equal footing and should not be construed together. Paragraph 14 is a constitutional provision that restricts the focus of special sessions of the General Conference. Paragraph 507 establishes the manner in which petitions are to be filed, but cannot supersede the constitutional provision of paragraph 14 and bestow the right to file petitions to a special session of the General Conference. As noted by Ms. Henry, paragraph 507 is derivative of the Constitution, not directive to the Constitution. The issue of how you define harmony and who defines harmony is at the very crux of the petition before the Judicial Council. This is apparent in all of the opening and reply briefs that have been filed. Along with the supremacy of the Constitution, this is the pivotal issue to be resolved by the Judicial Council. Paragraph 14 is Article 2 in Section 2 of the Constitution. Section 2 specifies the composition and powers of the General Conference. Thus, this placement of Paragraph 14 and a plain reading of such makes it clear that it is the right of the General Conference and the General Conference alone to determine if business to be transacted by a special session of the General Conference is in harmony with the purpose stated in the call for a special session. If this restriction and power is not preserved by the Judicial Council, then this power is transferred to any organization, clergy member, or lay member of the United Methodist Church to independently and according to their own criteria determine that their petition or petitions are in harmony with the purpose of a called session. Extending this power to any organization, clergy member, or lay member is congruent with a regular session of a general conference when theoretically the entire book of discipline is open for amendment. It is neither practical, congruent, or constitutional for a special session where this power is determined, where this power to determine harmony is restricted to the general conference. This is precisely why the Judicial Council decision in this matter is so significant, some might contend urgent. Opening the door to any organization, clergy member, or lay member of the United Methodist Church to determine if a petition is in harmony with the stated purpose of a special session would, in effect, nullify Section 2, Article 2 of the Constitution. Any special session would, in effect, become a regular session. This is a dangerous precedent. In this particular situation, the matter of determining harmony is further complicated by the fact that the final report from the Commission on a Way Forward and the Council of Bishops may not be available to the church until very near or on July 8, 2018 deadline for submitting petitions. This timeline is not a manipulation by the Commission on a Way Forward or the Council of Bishops, as some briefs have contended. The timeline was built with a reasonable assumption that the intent and action of the 2016 General Conference would be honored, namely, to only receive the work and report of the Commission and the Council. 
again, to permit potential petitioners to assume, speculate, or define what is congruent or in harmony with petitions filed under the restrictive pr provisions of a special session of general conference is reckless at best, unconstitutional at worst. Finally, a fifth cr uh, critical principle of the framework for the Judicial Council's decision is the matter that several briefs have identified as alternate actions. The bishop's call letter states the purpose of the special session of general conference, <coughs> excuse me, and I quote, shall be limited to receiving and acting upon a report from the Council of Bishops based on recommendations of the Commission on a Way Forward. This limitation is constitutional. Further, this limitation does not negate the leg legislative supremacy of the general conference, nor does it extend to the Council of Bishops or the Commission on a Way Forward power to limit the freedom of the general conference to act on important connectional matters. Reverend Boyette's re uh, reply brief is likely correct in pointing out that the general conference has the full range of legislative options available to it in acting on a report, including amending, substituting, tabling, approving, and disapproving the report and its recommendations. These several alternative actions preserve the legislative supremacy of the general conference. The legislative supremacy of a special session of the general conference is not dependent upon having alternative petitions before the general conference, many of which, I might note, were considered by the commission on a way forward. The primary authors of the Constitution surely had this in mind when drafting the restrictions for a special session in Article 2 of Section 2, namely Paragraph 14. In summary, a negative response to the question before the Judicial Council accomplishes the following four things. Number one, it honors the intent and actions of the 2016 General Conference, which duly exercised its legislative power over all matters distinctly connectional by asking the Council of Bishops to offer leadership in service to the General Conference. Number two, it preserves the fundamental authority and supremacy of the Constitution, namely paragraph 14, and does not raise the manner of submitting petitions specified in paragraph 507 to the level of constitutional right in the case of special sessions of general conference. Number three, it provides much needed clarification in the, and I quote, in harmony with the purpose, end quote, language in paragraph 14 of the Constitution. Number four, it retains the 2019 general conference's legislative role to employ a full range of alter alternative actions in receiving and acting on the concrete report and proposal it requested from the Council of Bishops and the Commission on a way forward. Finally, a negative response to the question before the Judicial Council in the petition for a declaratory decision will also serve the church well and help build trust as it seeks a way forward beyond our current impasse on human sexuality. On behalf of the Council of Bishops, I urge us to work together to honor the alternative approach chosen by the 2016 General Conference. Thank you very much. Thank you. We'll now have the respondent, General Commissioner. Honorable members of the Judicial Council, I am Gary George, a clergy member of the East Ohio Conference of the United Methodist Church, North Central Jurisdiction, and today I am the named representative of the Commission on the General Conference. The Commission on the General Conference was named as the respondent in the matter now pending before this Judicial Council and identified as docket item number 0501-8. I was named to represent the commission by its chairperson, Mr. Duncan McMillan, who is not able to be present today due to his vocational responsibilities. <coughs> the commission's membership, offer, officers, structure, and scope of responsibility is referenced in paragraph 511 in the current edition of the Book of Discipline of the United Methodist Church. The Commission on General Conference has submitted its written brief through its secretary, Kim Simpson. 
At this time, I would like to read into the record of this oral hearing the following statement, which is exerted from the Commission's response and submitted by its secretary. The Commission defines and understands its role to be one of implementing the actions and logistical responsibilities determined by the General Conference, rather than that of defining the particular wording of the call to the special session or the application of paragraphs 14 and paragraphs 507, respectively, as applying to the legislative process. Since the request from the Council of Bishops to have the Judicial Council issue a declaratory decision in this matter was granted, that determination is now rightly left to the Judicial Council and the Commission stands ready to imp implement whatever processes are appropriate and necessary to comply with this decision. Therefore, the Commission on General Conference, as an implementing organization of church policies, will not state an opinion on the matter before the Judicial Council in this docket. The Commission feels that as servants of the church who bear responsibility for creating the environment in which the best decision can be made, the role is not to enter into the specifics of this de debate, but rather to carry out the necessary arrangements per the ruling that will be made. Since the President of the Judicial Council named the Commission on the General Conference as respondent, if the Commission is required to provide an oral argument in order to be available to answer any questions from the members of the Judicial Council during this final 20 minutes that we are allotted, the Commission's representative, namely me, will simply read into the record that the Commission has decided it is not appropriate to communicate an opinion about the matter before the Judicial Council in this docket. Thank you for receiving this response. Honorable members and staff of the Judicial Council, fellow speakers and guests, and members of the live stream audience for the first time. My name is Reverend Gary Graves and I serve as the Secretary of the General Conference. It is in that role that I appear before you today and in that role, I serve as an ex officio, a member, uh, ex officio member of the Commission on the General Conference. In response to the call to serve as a respondent, I examined the role and the responsibilities of the office as found throughout the Book of Discipline and the plan of organization and rules of order of the General Conference. I found them to be notification, communication, credentialing, nomination of other leaders and selection of staff, coordination with the Council of Bishops in regard to nominations, elections, and appointments, organization of the committees of the General Conference, record keeping, including the DCA, the Daily Christian Advocate, the Book of Resolutions, and all documents submitted to the General Commission on Archives and History, education and preparation of delegates, supervision of voting and elections, the receipt of concerns about rule violations and the processing of those concerns in the appropriate manner, the determination of the format of petitions, including requirements of the Book of Discipline and the Plan of Organization and Rules of Order, the determination of the form for preparation of reports, resolutions, motions, and amendments. The examination of those petitions for violation of the rule against obscenity and defamation against individuals. The maintenance of the daily calendar of the General Conference. The receipt of submitted petitions and the determination of their validity within the formats, pres the formats prescribed. The coordination with the DCA editor and the publishing house to produce the advanced DCA as well as each of the daily editions, and the coordination with the named team to edit the Book of Discipline. Again, much in line with the Commission on General Conference, I did not find those responsibilities to include the determination of the question that is before you. I do stand ready to answer any questions that you might have regarding the process regarding the work of the Commission on the General Conference 
and on the work of the general conference as I will be undertaking it for the first time in the special session of 2019. Thank you for your time. Thank you. We now have the MRC Courier and we invite Reverend Keith Boyette. May it please the council. Thank you for the opportunity to address you as you issue a declaratory decision on the meaning, application, and effect of paragraphs 14 and 507 of the discipline. I urge you to hold that there is no conflict between these paragraphs, that petitions may be filed as provided for in paragraph 507 for the upcoming special session of the General Conference, and that all petitions proposing business in harmony with the purpose stated in the call for the special session may properly be considered by the delegates. These two provisions of the discipline, paragraph 14 and paragraph 507, are easily construed together. The relevant portion of paragraph 14 addresses what business can be transacted at a special session. Business in harmony with the purpose stated in the call is properly before the special session. Other business, not in harmony with the purpose stated in the call, can only be transacted if General Conference itself votes to consider such business by a two-thirds vote. Paragraph 507 addresses how business is placed before General Conference, whether in regular or special session. Business is placed before the General Conference by petition. Importantly, paragraph 507 provides that any organization, clergy member or lay member of the United Methodist Church may petition the General Conference. Nothing in paragraph 14 precludes the filing of any and all petitions. Paragraph 14 only addresses whether a petition would require a two-thirds vote to be considered, and the requirement of such a vote only applies to petitions not in harmony with the purpose stated in the call. Decision 227 addresses how these two provisions are to be construed. In Decision 227, the business to be considered by the 1966 adjourned session of the General Conference was limited to business in harmony with the purpose <coughs> stated for that session. In interpreting the words in harmony, the Judicial Council declared that business in harmony with the purpose included, and I quote, matters fairly established and embraced within that purpose. Because there is no conflict between paragraph 14 and 507, the fact that paragraph 14 is part of the Constitution is of no significance for purposes of deciding this case. Decision 227 is precedential, both res with respect to determining what is in harmony with the purpose stated in the call and the fact that the petition process is equally available for both regular and special sessions of the General Conference. Here, the call for the upcoming special session is to receive and act upon a report of the Council of Bishops based on the recommendation of the Commission on a Way Forward. Now, based on the May 4th motion adopted by the Council of Bishops summarizing its report, the report will propose changing the Book of Discipline in substantive and structural ways to address the decades-long conflict over our sexual ethics, our definition of marriage, and our ordination standards. It will present three plans that have been considered, a traditionalist plan, a one-church plan, and a connectional conference plan, and it will recommend the adoption of the one church plan. The delegates to the 2019 special session can affirm, reject, amend, or adopt a substitute for the report of the Council of Bishops as a means of acting on that report. 
any petition that would set forth a means of acting upon any of the plans mentioned in the report or that would set forth an alternative plan to resolve the underlying conflict addressed by the report would be a petition that would address a way in which the general conference might act upon the Council of Bishops report. Such a petition would therefore involve matters fairly embraced by the call and be business in harmony with the purpose stated in the call. Affirming now that such petitions may be filed and are in harmony with the call would enable such petitions to be delivered to the Secretary of the General Conference by the July 8th deadline, would allow them to be translated and printed in the advanced daily Christian advocate, would enable them to be debated by the membership of the United Methodist Church at large in the months leading up to the special session, and permit the delegates to this special session to study them in advance of arriving at that special session. I urge you to hold that any business in harmony with the purpose stated in the call to receive an act upon the request of the Council of Bishops is permissible at this special session without requiring a two-thirds vote. That business not in harmony may be considered at this special session as provided in paragraph 14 if consideration is approved by a two-thirds vote. That petitions may be filed as outlined in paragraph 507 and must be print printed in the advanced daily Christian advocate. And that petitions in harmony with the purposes stated in the call for this special session if it addresses a means of acting upon the report, including addressing a way to amend the report or proposing a substitute for such report. Thank you very much. Thank you. Stephanie Henry. Good morning. I'm Stephanie Henry, a young adult laywoman from the Upper New York Annual Conference, recently relocated to Seattle, Washington. I am a lifelong United Methodist and a PK, or pastor's kid. Formally, I want to thank you, Mr. President, and the members of the council for allowing me to address you on this important matter. Before us this morning is the business before the 2019 special called session of the General Conference. Constitutional paragraph 14 defines the purpose of a called special session as to be that which is stated in the call. The sentence of import within paragraph 14 is a compound sentence. Now, I had to go back to my primary school days to remind myself what that means. But that means that the clause before the comma is independent from the clause following the comma. Thus, quote, the purpose of such special session shall be stated in the call. Full stop, end quote. The next independent clause provides clarification if the purpose of the special session by way of the call is broad. We must look at this sentence of the paragraph concurrently with the call of the 2019 special session. Quote, the purpose of this special session of the general conference shall be limited to receiving and acting upon a report from the Council of Bishops based on the recommendations of the Commission on the Way Forward. There has been much discussion regarding the precedent of Judicial Council Decision 227 regarding the 1966 adjourned session of the General Conference. What has been completely remiss is that Judicial Council Decision 302 specifically states, quote, this, leaving the wording special rather than changing it to adjourned, was agreed to in light of the constitutional provision for special session, which, so far as membership is concerned, is not different from what would obtain if it were an adjourned session, end quote. Decision 302 equates an adjourned session to a special session by membership only. It does not reference the business or purpose of such a session. Therefore, the decision regarding the business before the 1966 adjourned session of the General Conference, as given by Decision 227, is not applicable in our current situation. If the members of the council are not convinced by this distinction, I also argue that the purpose stated in the call of the 1966 adjourned session was broad. Quote, for the sole purpose of reviewing and acting on questions of church union, included also may be a report of progress in the elimination of the central jurisdiction, end quote. 
questions of church union, and there may be a report of progress. The broad scope of this adjourned session did not explicitly restrict the business to one particular item. Therefore, decision 227 in allowing legislative materials was congruous with the stated purpose of the session. To be clear, there is no conflict or contradiction between paragraphs 14 and 507, but there is hierarchy in the basis of their law. The petition process in paragraph 507 is not limited to regular sessions, but it is restricted based on the constitutional definition of the purpose of a special session and the explicit call of each special session. The allowance of legislative materials then prompted the ensuing discussion regarding our items in harmony with the call. I will not spend any of my time discussing the definition of what is in harmony because of the independent nature of the first clause of the relevant sentence in paragraph 14. In this case of the 2019 special session, there is no ambiguity with the purpose as is stated in the call. In the current situation, some have claimed that if the council rules against the allowance of petitions to the 2019 special session, that it would somehow be a reversal of decision 227. I think the differences between 1966 and 2019 are clear, namely an adjourned session versus a special session, the now constitutional nature of paragraph 14, and most importantly, the differences in the expressly worded calls. To touch just very briefly on the inharmony debate, I want to warn that the printing of potentially proper amendments or substitutes as pre-submitted petitions would be a dangerous precedent. The assumption that they would be brought to the floor is incorrect and overrides the authority of the presiding officer to guide the work of the body. Paragraph 507 dictates that all petitions must receive a vote by legislative committee and plenary. No such law exists for amendments or substitutes. Formally presenting them by printing them in the advanced daily Christian advocate would effectively amount to the council achieving the establishment of a new rule. I also want to raise that the Commission on the General Conference, in conjunction with the business manager's office, is working very hard to ensure that any material brought to the body from the floor will be quickly and efficiently translated so that delegates may make informed decisions. Several petitions relating to the matter of human sexuality were before the 2016 General Conference, and yet that body approved a different way, quote, to move the United Methodist Church forward, end quote. Not only do our rules and precedents properly limit the purpose of the 2019 special session to only receiving and acting upon the Council of Bishops report and no other legislative material, I think that petitions would be disruptive to the stated purpose of the 2019 special session. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Mr. Scott Jones. May it please the council, I'm grateful for the opportunity to present at this oral hearing in support of my request that you rule, declaring that all petitions on the subject matter of the Council of Bishops report are permissible for consideration of the 2019 special session of the General Conference. The main issue before this council is whether the people of the United Methodist Church have a right to provide input to the decisions affecting our denomination. This right is crucial in our connectional system for trust and transparency. While the decisions are made by duly elected representatives of the clergy and the laity, the right to petition the General Conference is an important way for the voice of the people to be heard. Nothing in the Constitution generally, and nothing in paragraph 14 specifically, prohibits the people from petitioning the General Conference on the subject which it has been called to consider at a special session. As a bishop, it's an important aspect of my role to be an advocate for the whole church and to seek the establishment of fair, inclusive processes for decision making. I am not advocating for or against any particular model included in the council's report. I am an advocate for allowing the voice of the people to be heard regarding the limited agenda for which the special session of the general conference has been called. The Council of Bishops has petitioned for you to clarify the rules on this matter. Bishop O's brief has suggested that this avenue of participation be denied to anyone who is not a part of the majority of the council or a voting delegate to the special session of the general conference. I disagree. 
Although the Council of Bishops sets the subject matter, other ideas worthy of consideration may arise through the petition process. The Council of Bishops is not the repository of all wisdom. The Judicial Council, as the arbiters of the law of the church, should look to the legislative intent of paragraph 507 and to the Constitution as it embodies our highest values. The Judicial Council should look for interpretations that harmonize the Constitution with legislative enactments and not allow uncalled for contradictions. The Council's interpretive approach should presume congruence unless forced to see a contradiction. Some of the briefs have debated the words in harmony. I think the Council should focus on what it means to be in harmony with the purpose stated in the call. Decision 227 does give the Council guidance in this respect, notwithstanding it was decided at a time when there was no constitutional provision for a special session. To say that the precedential value of 227 is more apparent than actual, loses sight of the fact that the decision directly addresses the question of who can send a petition to a called session with a limited agenda. My argument is that the precedential value is the way in which in harmony applies to the right to petition. Paragraph 507 gives United Methodist organizations, clergy, and lay members the right to petition General Conference so long as their petitions conform to its requirements. Paragraph 14 of the Constitution impacts that right but does not take away that right. There are advocates here who would read the language of the paragraph as prohibiting the filing of any petition in this special session other than the Council of Bishops report. That's a flawed reading of paragraph 14. It does not prohibit the filing of a petition. It only requires that the petition be in harmony with the stated purpose of the called special session. That is not a prohibition. There is nothing in the language of paragraph 14 that conflicts with paragraph 507, which gives clergy and lay members the right to petition the General Conference of the United Methodist Church. These two provisions, the constitutional provision and the legislative enactment, complement each other and express the collective will of the General Conference. It is the General Conference that will determine, through its Committee on Reference, whether any submitted petition addresses the subject matter identified in the call. The General Conference did ask the Council of Bishops to bring a report, but it never asked the Council to restrict input by denying the right to petition on the same subject matter. It is quite enlightening to note that when the provision for a special session was elevated to constitutional status, the General Conference in its wisdom did not limit the right to file a petition to only the Council of Bishops. In like manner, upon the enactment of 507, we find no exclusion of special sessions in the right to petition the General Conference. Last, I will address the assertion that to allow petitions is tantamount to picking up where the 2016 General Conference left off. I reject this assertion. The Commission and Council of Bishops have developed proposals that have moved the conversation forward, and the whole church owes them a debt of gratitude for their work on a difficult task. Just as a study committee considers various alternatives and then makes its work available to the conference, so the commission and the Council of Bishops have brought, have brought much improved options to the table. We are not at the same place we were in May of 2016. Increased disobedience by bishops and by conferences has narrowed the range of workable options, and the hopes for some for easy answers to a move forward have been much reduced. The General Conference needs the wisdom of the whole church in order to decide our next steps. Such wisdom comes best through an open, transparent, and fair petition process. The question before us is whether the three options the Council is presenting ought to be the only options the General Conference is allowed to consider. The General Conference should not be constrained by a limitation on its sources of ideas for consideration. It should be empowered by the Council of Bishops and by the wisdom generated by the petition process to do its work on the subject matter for which it has been called, allowing all petitions that are in harmony with the subject matter of the Council of Bishops report will accomplish that noble mission. Thank you. Thank you. John LaPerry's. Thank you for the privilege of speaking today. I speak to respectfully ask the Judicial Council to ensure a just, open, and transparent process in which United Methodists, other than bishops, will not lose their right 
even temporarily, to petition General Conference with their deep concerns and constructive proposals. We have a clear precedent for this in the special 1966 Methodist General Conference. As I noted, that conference's restricted business included receiving and acting upon a commission's report. Thanks to decision 227, this acting upon included considering various amendments and petitions proposed on the same subject matter of that report. That 1966 conference handled a wider range of very complex issues and they were able to manage it in just four days. And so can we. We see that the 1964 Methodist discipline on which decision 227 was based uh, has the same essential language that is key for this case. I'm referring to that key sentence that was quoted by Ms. Henry, which is essentially identical today to what we have now. If the council is interested, I do have printed copies of the relevant language from the 1964 text. Mr. Starnes and some other conference chancellors appear to argue that we delegates cannot make major amendments or substitute motions to the Council of Bishops report. They talk about how we can vote yes or no, and if we want to do anything else, we can wait until 2020. I'm sorry, but that is just not logical. Are there other parts of our rules of order that also become invalid in 2019? And why would both the 2016 General Conference and the Council of Bishops say that they wanted to schedule this special conference across multiple days if the only business was just to hear a couple speeches for and against, vote yes or no, and then go home by lunch? But if any proposal would be in order as a last minute amendment, then it would, by definition, be within the area of business for the conference. And therefore, the content of such proposals would be in order to submit in advance as petitions. Mr. Starnes correctly notes that the provision for special conferences was moved into the Constitution in 1968. But then in 1972 came Judicial Council decision number 350. At one point, decision number 350 invoked decision 227 and said nothing about this key precedent being at all lessened just because some, key, some, some provisions about general conferences were moved. <coughs> To say that no one other than a majority faction of bishops may petition the 2019 conference would defy our long history of democratic governance. In decision number 929, the Judicial Council ruled that defining who may petition any general conference is a distinctly connectional issue and that no one besides general conference can limit it. 929 said that in the absence of any clear disciplinary restriction Paragraph 507 should basically be interpreted broadly, according to decision 929. Four days in 2019 gives us 40% of the time of the 2016 conference to handle probably much fewer than even 15% of the petitions. Given our short time frame now, I would not expect that many petitions to actually be submitted. I certainly would not expect that every petition deferred in 2016 would be brought back, but it's only fair to allow at least a few to finally be considered if someone really wants it. I keep hearing about the supposed intent of delegates, but I have heard recently from several delegates who voted for the Howard motion who assure me that they did not intend to restrict alternative proposals, as has been argued. All of us speaking today are part of official United Methodist bodies. None of us is authorized to take a position on behalf of the councils, commissions, or delegations that we come from. But speaking as one young adult lay delegate to the 2019 conference, I would like to let you know that for me to be able to do my job well on behalf of the church we love, it is essential that my fellow delegates and I will be able to see as many of the different proposals out there as possible, printed and translated into our own language well ahead of time to carefully read and consider the possibilities. It is essential that we be able to legislate with a genuine range of choices. It is essential that whether or not a particular petition can even be considered is something that gets decided according to clear, reasonable boundaries, not last minute arbitrary decisions. I affirm Bishop O's point that some clarification there would be helpful. What we delegates do not need are rushed, last minute arbitrary decisions. We delegates do not need to have our only avenue for considering alternative proposals to be limited to complex, last minute, quickly written, hastily read, and inadequately translated floor motions. We delegates do not need to have timelines and legislative processes manipulated to steer us to certain predetermined decisions before we have had any chance 
to make our own decisions. We need a fair, transparent, and open process. I am regularly in contact with fellow delegates, and I know I speak for many of us around the world by asking the Council to please allow us to do the job we were elected to do by allowing us to review different petitions ahead of time by offer and by offering clear guidance on the boundaries of acceptable business. Thank you. Thank you. Tell me you stars. <laughs> May it please the Council. My name is Tom Starnes. I'm Chancellor of the Baltimore Washington Conference, as I've indicated in um, the brief that's been submitted on behalf of, I think it was 24 chancellors. None of us have presented this brief in our own capacity. We are <coughs> knowledgeable about some legal issues, but we are essentially laity in the United Methodist Church, most of us for our entire lives, many of us. Preacher's kids or chancellor's kids or- Will you kindly speak louder? I'm sorry? Speak louder? Can you speak louder? Oh, yes, I can. Get, get closer to the mic. Okay. I want to focus in my remarks not on rehashing what was in our brief. I, I certainly rely on what was in the brief. Uh, I want to focus on the word purpose. You've heard a lot about harmony, um, but I don't think the briefs do good enough service to the word purpose. And your ultimate task is to focus on section 14 of the discipline of the Constitution that requires the business transacted at an annual conference to be that which is consistent with the purpose of the call. I want to start like Secretary Tron did with a quote from John Wesley because I start there because it relates to the purpose that I think is the only fair reading of the record of the 2016 General Conference, of the vision statement and mission statement, of the Commission on the Way Forward, and of the Bishop's uh, role in this matter. John Wesley wrote in 1786, two years after this body was formed as an autonomous church, that to separate, quote, to separate ourselves from a body of living Christians with whom we were before united is a grievous be breach of the law of love. It is the nature of love to unite us together. And the greater the love, the stricter the union. And while this continues in its strength, nothing can divide those whom love has united. Now I start there because if you fairly read the excerpts of the Daily Christian Advocate from May 17, 2016 in Portland, you will find folks rising from the floor of the General Conference and asking the bishops to lead us to find a way forward to keep us united, notwithstanding our differences. There was no illusion that those differences would be glossed over that those differences would be resolved. What there was was a plea from the body, a majority vote, not by a wide margin, but a majority vote of the supreme legislative body of the denomination asking the bishops to find a different way than we have tried for 40 years quadrennially to hold us together. The bishops returned the next morning and understanding that the plea had been for unity and leadership, Bishop O began by quoting from the Epistle to the Galatians, that notwithstanding our differences, I don't need to read it to you all, notwithstanding our differences, we are one in Jesus Christ. He then said, quoting from a statement that was displayed on the screen, printed in the Daily Christian Advocate, quote, we understand that part of our role as bishops is to lead the church toward new behaviors a new way of being and new forms and structures which allow a unity of our mission of making disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world while allowing for differing expressions as a global church. Transparently, there in the record of the 2016 General Conference is the purpose that the bishops had in mind. 
There was then a vote, it was approved by the majority of the General Conference. And the very purpose of this call is not simply reflected in the statement issued in August 2017. If you want to take that view, you're going to drain the purpose of this call of any significant meaning. It is not simply to receive a part and receive a report and act on it in any way one might choose. It is to receive a particular recommendation from our bishops, the Episcopal leaders of the church, on how we can stay together. With the multiple expressions from the floor that the way we've tried to do this before has not worked, with an avalanche of petitions hatched and voted on in the moment, overwhelming whatever agenda anybody might come in with. I submit to you that that's the purpose of this call. If we open it up to a flood of petitions, any petition that any United Methodist might want to file, we are going to nullify that purpose. We should not kid ourselves. We have invested much in this process. Our bishops have invested much. The 34 members of the commission have invested much. And I'm not speaking of money. I'm speaking of heart and soul, led by three moderator bishops. Don't nullify the clear purpose of the way forward approach. I do not suggest, if I suggested this, I, it was a mistake, that there can be no motions from the floor of the special session of the General Conference. I do think motions to substitute and motions to amend are subject to the same restriction in the Constitution that applies to petitions. I frankly don't think you have to rule out all petitions, but you have to have them be consistent with and congruent with the recommendation of the bishops that the General Conference asked for. Thank you. Thank you. Do you say it? <coughs> Rebutta? Thank you very much. Uh, thank, uh, <clears throat> let me begin by just uh, commenting how stimulating this is. Um, I wouldn't consider myself a disciplinary nerd, but it is kind of, it's been fun. So um, I appreciate the, the, the thoroughness of, uh, of the various arguments. Let me, uh, let me try to summarize uh, a few comments, uh, some of which will be uh, uh, in rebuttal, uh, of rebuttal nature and others that are more of a summary of my comments. I believe the Judicial Council has before it um, a very critical matter and a matter that uh, will transcend uh, the immediate uh, call for a 2019 special session of the General Conference. What is decided here will in fact uh, probably define the nature of special sessions of the General Conference going forward. Therefore, I believe you need to give precedent and priority to uh, three matters that I've already identified. First is the intent and action and purpose of the 2016 General Conference. I think you cannot ignore uh, what you just heard from uh, Mr. Starnes. This is critical to understanding um, what uh, is before you and therefore informing your decision. Secondly, as I've mentioned earlier, I think you cannot overlook the matter of the supremacy of the Constitution. I know that uh, there's disagreement about construing uh, paragraph 14 and 507, but uh, I would just remind you that paragraph 14 is a constitutional matter. Paragraph 507 uh, is a disciplinary matter that outlines the, the process for petitions. It cannot, in my opinion, uh, supersede uh, the Constitution and what it says about the limited nature of a special uh, session. Third, um, I believe that uh, the matter of harmony does need to be resolved. Um, and I, I, would, I would just point out that what's before the, uh, the, the council as it relates to harmony is the matter of harmony with the purpose of the call, not the harmony not whether petitions are in harmony with the report that will come. 
some of the arguments have, have uh, conflated those. What's before you is whether or not um, anything is, would be in harmony with the call. And the call is very limited. The call is, the call is about the Council of Bishops bringing a report to the General Conference for its action. That's the call. Maybe another way to say this is that harmony is not defined by Webster's Dictionary as it relates to the discipline. Harmony is not defined by petitioners, as I pointed out in my opening comments. Harmony is not defined by the Judicial Council or the Council of Bishops. In the case of paragraph 14, harmony is determined only by the General Conference, and the General Conference can only make that decision once it's convened. Any filing of petitions and uh, the printing of those petitions in the advanced daily advocate prior to the convening of the general conference would in effect be an effort to define what is in harmony with the call. Even though many of those petitions would be filed in an attempt to try to be in harmony with the subject matter, which is not what's before the court. I would uh, suggest that um, uh, Furthermore, in relationship to uh, decision 227, that that was a matter of being in harmony with two very broad purposes has already been identified. The matter of church union and the matter of elimination, of potential elimination of central conference. What's distinctive here is that this particular call by the Council of Bishops, which again is constitutional, is very narrow. It's specific, receive, act receive, act on a report from the Council of Bishops. It's not broad, which, in the, which in the, was the case as related to decision 227. Finally, I, or not finally, but in addition, I would uh, comment that, um, that uh, Ms. Henry's uh, observation is accurate, that uh, a variety of petitions coming before the Judicial Council in effect would be disrupted to the purpose of, of the special session. This argument was also made by Mr. Starnes. I would also agree with uh, my colleague, Bishop Jones, that the Council of Bishop is not a repository of all wisdom. I only wish that were true. And if it were true, we'd probably have a pope, right? But it's not true. Um, and that's exactly why uh, the position that I've articulated suggests that we should honor the decision of the 2016 General Conference. Let's not try to take their wisdom away by assuming that they would like to have a lot of other petitions filed. There's nothing in, nothing in the action that they took that requests or even hints at additional petitions being brought forward uh, to the called session of the General Conference. I would also uh, briefly comment that, um, that I believe a just and open and transparent process, as was uh, argued for by uh, Mr. Lamparis, is not something that would be accomplished by more petitions. It would be accomplished by honoring what the 2016 General Conference asked to be done. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bishop. We now have questions from the Council members. I'd like to direct my question to Bishop Og. Yes, sir. Uh, there are two uh, paragraphs, one in the Constitution and the other one is the discipline. I refer to paragraph 14 of the Constitution and 507 of the discipline, which uh, is cited in your uh, main argument. And uh, let me read that for clarity regarding the purpose. 
the last sentence of paragraph 14. The purpose of such a special session shall be stated in the call, and only such business shall be transacted as is in harmony with the purpose stated in such call, unless the general conference by two-thirds vote shall determine that other business may be transacted. To me, this whole sentence embraces first the general rule and the second started by the word unless is the exception. One difference I note with your argument and those of the Amici, Curia, is that they say you have a restricted view while they have an open view. Because uh, in your argument, you would require two-thirds vote even to determine harmony with the purpose. Do they get you right? Correct. But you are mixing the general rule with the exception. The plain reading of this sentence, purpose of special session is one, as I said, business may be transacted only which is in harmony with the purpose. And the exception is unless general conference by two thirds vote shall determine that other business may be transacted. In other words, you require only the two thirds vote of the general conference if for other business, not in harmony with the call. Would you not like to reconsider your stand? No, let me uh, respond. Um, you're correct in, uh, in rereading the disciplinary clause because it says it would t require two thirds vote of the general conference to enact other business, correct? So the general conference will not convene until February. The printing of petitions uh, in the Christian Daily Advocate in the assumption that the general conference might, by two-thirds vote, include them, sends a message, as already been argued, uh, to the church that they are valid uh, matters before uh, the, the, the general conference, when in fact, the first phrase, the restricted phrase, is what takes precedent as you head into a general conference. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, the bishop will. Oh, <laughs> I, I wanted to be done. <laughs> I was trying to get your attention. I apologize. Let me kind of ask that question in a different way for my clarification that in your understanding that the purpose of the call session, thank you, uh, which is to have the special session of the general conference to respond to and act upon the report from the way forward by way for the Council of Bishops. In your understanding, does that preclude that that report cannot be amended or substituted? No, I, I think uh, we cannot, uh, we, we cannot, and I would hope this uh, council would not in any way uh, uh, impede or obstruct the legislative supremacy of the general conference. So once the report is before them and in petition form, then they have the option of dealing with it in any manner that they care to. They could amend, they could substitute, they could uh, defer it, they could, uh, or table it, they could uh, defeat it, um, they could say, we'll take it up in 2020. Um, I mean, there's no restriction. Okay, all right, thank you. Bishop. <laughs> All right, um, you can tell how anxious I am to go sit down. So. <laughs> uh, just to uh, have a little bit broader picture, 
and to make some clarity for me. Uh, in, the, in the news and in the media after the Council of Bishops meeting, it has been a little bit unclear for me what the bishops are really proposing. Are they proposing all three proposals with one recommendation? Or as you said in your presentation here, that you are presenting one, uh, the one church plan, and only give the historical background from the others. I think it, uh, it's interesting for the council to know if you bring three proposals that are not really in harmony with each other uh, also to the body, or if you're only being one. Yeah, uh, thank you for the question because uh, the council is fully aware that the motion that was approved uh, by the uh, council of bishops and distributed immediately after our meeting uh, left some things ambiguous. And as you well know from following uh, the press, uh, various bishops began to uh, reflect on that and interpret it differently. Uh, Bishop Carter, um, in consultation with all of the bishops on the commission on the way forward, and then uh, through action of the executive committee, issued a subsequent statement that clarified that. And the intent is to bring uh, to the uh, general conference in our report the recommendation of what's called the One Church Plan, and then also um, a, an historical narrative that will include the other plans for information purposes, including uh, legislative implications. Now, what that means is that um, the legislative paragraphs that would likely need to be uh, changed in order to implement any one of those other two plans will be there for the entire uh, general conference to have access to. This is an attempt, as I said in my opening comments, to be uh, transparent about all the work that was before the commission. And it's also an attempt to honor um, what the Council of Bishops has understood from the very beginning, and that is the, the full nature of the Commission on a Way Forwards report uh, would be uh, given to the general conference. Thank you. Yes. Bishop, oh, you get a break. I have oh. questions for. Thank you, uh, Reverend Tran. But first of all, thank you, Bishops O and Jones, for, for your service to the church and for your presence here. I have questions for Mr. Starnes, uh, Ms. Henry, and Bishop Jones. So uh, I'll go first with Mr. Starnes. And also, thank you, Mr. Starnes, for your service to the church and, and your presence here. Mr. Starts in your brief, um, you um, remind the council of the fact that the Constitution is the supreme law of the church. Yet at the same time, you uh, seem to also reject the argument that there is a right to file a petition, especially you seem to argue that paragraph 507 uh, only describes the process of filing a petition but does not guarantee the right to file a petition. Now, um, my question to you is, is there a right to file a petition guaranteed in church law at all? I would put it this way. The my argument, first of all, was that I think fairly read paragraph 507 is meant to control the manner in which uh -huh. petitions are filed. I don't deny that it can be interpreted as saying anyone can file uh, a petition. Um, nevertheless, that's a legislatively granted right. So I know the council would agree with me that, that any right that's legislative is confined by the Constitution. And so the Constitution clearly provides that special sessions can be limited to a, a given purpose. And it's certainly the case that there can be purposes that would preclude certain kinds of petitions from being filed. My, my follow-up question is, now you, you I, made the distinction d between uh, constitutional law and statutory law. Correct. And um, I'm just wondering, uh, you're 
familiar with paragraph four of the Constitution, the inclusiveness, which guarantees the right uh, to anyone, regardless of, of race, ethnicity, color, and, and uh, culture and language, uh, to participate in worship services in the programs of uh, the United Methodist Church. Could one make the argument, though, that if the Constitution guarantees the right of a professing member, that this right of membership should also include the right to petition not only the annual conference, but also the general conference? Yeah, honestly, um, Secretary Tron, I, I, I have not thought about whether a right to petition that has been legislatively granted should be incorporated into that inclusiveness provision and become constitutional standing. I don't think that can be squared, frankly, given a particular case with the right to limit the purpose of a called special session. Nor do I think, it, it, nor do I think doing that in this instance eliminates the right of folks to petition. It simply says, if we want to do it in the way we've been doing it, that will happen in 2020. This one is to be limited to a particular purpose. I would say as well, and this goes in, in part to what uh, Member uh, Rees or Rays was, was saying, I, I don't think it's imperative for you to read, I think the bishops are reading paragraph 14 as saying, the purpose of this call was to receive our report and our report alone and a petition based on that, asking you to enact the recommendation. And that's the reason why they would say anything else is by definition not in harmony and requires the two-thirds vote. There's another way you can look at it. You can look at it as saying um, the purpose of any petition has to be such as I've described it, one that really gives meaning to the call. Uh, and then you all could review once you have a petition in your hand in black and white, uh, or someone could bring an appeal to you once you have a petition in black and white and say that's either in or out. That's either consistent with that purpose, in harmony with that purpose, or it's not. So I think both of those options are uh, viable under the Thank Constitution. Thank you, Mr. Starks. Sure. Ms. Henry, I, uh, may I ask you a question, too? <coughs> also, thank you, Ms. Henry, for your service to the church and for your presence here. Uh, Ms. Henry, in your opening brief, uh, you question whether uh, Decision 227 still has presidential value and you're probably um, familiar with the, uh, the legal principle, stare decisis, which is a principle whereby a court is bound to follow its own precedents. And as you uh, mentioned in your brief, paragraph 2611 uh, is enshrining that principle with the only limitation which says that except where church law has been revised, I have to look it up to read it to you, um, except where their basis has been changed by the terms of the plan of union or other revisions of church law. Now here's my question. The, the term other revisions of church law, does that uh, A, include or refer to formal revisions of church law, B, substantive revisions of church law, or C, all of the above? And the question, the reason why I'm asking this is Judicial Council Decision 227 is based not only on uh, paragraph 509 of the 1964 discipline, but also paragraph 510. And as you mentioned, 509 has been uh, repealed. However, 510 in substance is still uh, there in 507 of the current discipline. So we have a situation where there's a formal uh, revision, but there's also a substantive revision of church law. My question to you, if you say that 227 is no longer applicable uh, precedent or case law, uh, then on the basis of what definition of the word other revisions of church law? Do you understand my question? I think I do. I'll give it a good shot. 
Um, I have no legal background, so my background is in science, so I'll do my best. Um, my interpretation is that all see all of the above, the evolate the elation or advancement of the structuring of special sessions from paragraph 509 when it was in 1966, 1964, to now constitutional paragraph 14. That I think was the A, uh, what was that called, sorry. Uh, that was a direct law change. Um, I also think that 227 does not, no longer has presidential value because of the specifically stated calls for each special session. So I don't think that you can just look at law on the law alone. You have to look at the context in which the law is being applied, is my understanding. Hopefully that's true. Um, so that's why I would think that 227 is no longer applicable, is not only the law changed from to now constitutional paragraph 14, but also the context surrounding that decision of law. Mm -hmm. Does that answer your question? Thank you, Ms. Henry. Thank you. Bishop Jones, I have a, may I ask you a question too? And also, Bishop Jones, thank you for being here and your service to the church. Bishop, in your opening brief, you made the uh, argument that to give the Council of Bishops the power to define the purpose would be uh, a breach of separation of powers. Is that a correct That's true. formulation? Yes. Um, now, in my understanding of uh, separation of powers or violation thereof, um, you can only se uh, violate the separation if you uh, claim powers that do not belong to you or restrict the powers of the other body. Uh, help me understand here because it, it, it seems to me like it, it, it is paragraph 14, the Constitution itself, that puts the limitation on uh, the General Conference and not the Council of Bishops. Can you help me understand this? Dr. Tran, my apologies if I was not clear enough in my brief. Uh, there's a distinction between what power the Council of Bishops has been given and what it has not been given. It has clearly been given the power to set the subject matter of the General Conference. It has not been given the power to restrict uh, what the General Conference may consider. The brief submitted by Bishop O uh, talked about how things must be in harmony with the content of the council's report. Uh, the uh, word consistency was even used in the uh, question that was posed to the judicial council. The council of bishops has not been given the ability to restrict what the general conference may consider. And that was my reason for suggesting this was uh, a violation of the separation of powers. If no petitions and no other ideas were going to be allowed. The council can restrict it to the subject matter. It cannot restrict the content that will be in front of the delegates. Thank you, Bishop. Question. I would like to address my question to my bishops. Bishop um, O and Bishop Jones, um, both of you. It is regarding the purpose of the call and who is making the call. This is a factual background. Do I understand correctly that the council of the bishop is the one reporting to the general conference rather than the way the, the commission on a way forward reporting. That is, the executive branch presenting a report to the legislative branch. Uh, as I indicated in my uh, opening comments today, and I took uh, a, sub a substantial amount of my time uh, in this regard, the Council of Bishops has understood itself uh, to to be a servant of the General Conference. We, we are trying to fulfill what the 2016 General Conference asked us to do. Uh, if you look at the full body of the report, 
that was, uh, was submitted by the Council of Bishops, uh, which we titled an offering uh, on a way forward, uh, you'll, and was approved by the Howard motion uh, because it accepted the entire report. Uh, there are very, there's very specific language about asking the council to lead and in two or three different cases, calls on the council to report back to the general conference. So yes, the council has, from the very beginning, has understood that we would make a report to the general conference. However, uh, we also understand <coughs> that it's uh, the, the commission, it, the commission on the way forward, which has done the body of the work, uh, that their full report will be available. And so the council's report will, if you will, sort of envelop the council of Bish the council, the commission on the ways forward report. So the general conference is not going to be denied anything that the commission. Uh, has discussed or formulated in their report. Mm -hmm. Yes, I have the an offering for a way forward. Thank you, my bishop. And I see under continuing discussions that what you're talking about, that we will continue to explore options to help the church live in grace with one another and down there, we will continue our conversation on this matter and report our progress to you and to the whole church. So I just wanted to make clear that the general conference and the um, uh, gave you gave us this um, the authority to do this. My bishop, thank you. Um, Bishop Scott Jones. <clears throat> uh, did you hear my question to Bishop Wog and his answer regarding the last sentence of paragraph 14? Yes. And I said, the last sentence consists of the general rule and the exception. Yes. The two-thirds vote of the general conference is required only if the petition is seen as not in harmony with the purpose of the call. Would you have the same uh, view as uh, Bishop Og? I think we have different views on this matter. In my view, in harmony applies to the subject matter so that the purpose of the call was for the general conference to consider the report and act upon it, which means that anything addressing the same paragraphs that are in the commission's report would be in harmony. The question that I hope- And, and if it is in harmony, there is no need for a two-thirds vote that is my view of the matter. And what would, what would be enough? Majority? In my brief, I have suggested a procedure that the General Conference might well use. It has a committee on reference that has already been functioning during the last General Conference. It could easily be called into session this summer. It could bring to the General Conference a recommendation. Let's say 10 petitions have been received and five of them are addressing the same paragraphs in the council's report, and five of them are on some extraneous matter. The committee on reference makes the judgment because the question of actually determining whether something is in harmony or not belongs not to the judicial council, but to the, to the general conference, acting through its committees. What I envision might work is that the Committee on Reference would bring then a report that says, here are petitions that we are recommending be considered in harmony and ones that are not in harmony. It would be a vote of the General Conference to aggregately uh, approve the Committee on References report or to amend it if necessary because it belongs to the General Conference to determine whether or not something is uh, in harmony or not. That's part of the responsibilities of the Committee on Reference, as in the rules of the General Conference currently. So in conclusion, would you agree with my view that the two-thirds vote is required only for petitions or business transaction not deemed 
in harmony with the purpose. That That's is, the exception. That is the exception. I think you have read it correctly. I'm, I'm glad uh, I have uh, somebody who concurs. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, I have a question for Bishop Owen. Please bring with you a copy of the offering for a way forward. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Uh, I've, I've read this document numerous times, uh, and I focus on the paragraph that you denominate next steps, uh, which says that this commission will develop a complete examination and possible revision of every paragraph in the book of discipline. I read that to mean they can propose legislation to change paragraphs in the discipline that deal with human sexuality and that this complete examination will support such legislation. And then I read at the, at the end of that, should they, the commission, complete their work in time, we will call a two or three day gathering. Now where within this document does it say anything about the Council of Bishops taking over and taking whatever it <laughs> desires from the commission and making the report? to the Special General Conference. Yeah, I think, um, I think you have to read the report in toto uh, in, because the uh, General Conference by, the 2016 General Conference by its action uh, asked the Council of Bishops to uh, form uh, the commission and to put uh, that entire process in, uh, in operation. So I think they have generally, we have given oversight to that entire process. Well, did the General Conference direct the Council of Bishops to do anything that's not within the four corners of these two pages here? No, I don't, I don't believe so, and I don't think the Council is. I think the Council is going to bring back a report that uh, meets the, uh, the intent of, of the action of the General Conference. Okay, but it's your position that the Council of Bishops can determine what the intent was, notwithstanding the words on these pages and take over the process and it will make the report, it will make the recommendation as you said you will for the one church plan. It will bring, it will bring as I mentioned uh, just a few moments ago, it will bring the full body of the work of the commission on a way forward. All right, and you plan to do that by July the 8th? That's the intent, uh, to have everything uh, edited. The commission had a final meeting after the Council of Bishops so that they could complete their work based on uh, input from the council and knowing what the council's uh, recommendations would be. And uh, the intent then is to uh, find, after the editing is completed, to have everything translated into the languages of the general conference. And that's for the purpose of making sure that the full report from the commission, which will be quite detailed, is available fairly to the entire church at the same time. Will it include legislation to put into effect the one church plan? Yes. Will it also have include legislation to include the multi-conference plan? Uh, as I indicated earlier, that those legis the, the legislative items will be available as information and the implications of those will be a part of the historical narrative that the uh, Council of Bishops will share. And again, that <coughs> historical narrative is intended to, uh, uh, to uh, lend to the transparency of the entire process. So that should the, the special conference decide to adopt the multi-conference plan, it would have legislation there that it could use to do that? It would be, it would be available, uh, it, would available. Not be, it, would, it would not be in petition form. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yes, um, uh, Bishop O. As, as, I, as I perceive it, the, the bishop's report will, um, would be incorporating 
the, the, the report and recommendations uh, that were received by the commission is that with, with the bishop's recommendation as to which way to go, which plan to use, the one church plan, but it would, inc it would incorporate um, um, at least by reference the work that they did so that it would be before the body? Correct. Um, and the other, the other question that I have um, is in relative, relative to Warren's, what was Warren's concern. Um, would it be fair to say that the motion that was passed the day before on Tuesday um, that led to the written um, report of um, the way forward on Wednesday morning, that the, that the Mark Holland motion of Tuesday um, is, is part and parcel of, this, uh, of, of the action and the energy going forward and, and, and resulting in that written report, as well as the debate and clarification that followed um, your bringing of that report on Wednesday morning. Clearly the bishops, the Council of Bishops was acting um, under the uh, pressure mm -hmm. uh, of all that was transpiring at the 2016 General Conference. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Holland motion, uh, the debate that had been happening uh, on the floor, and to some degree the conversations around the edges all were a part of the consideration on how to best formulate uh, that, uh, um, uh, that proposal, which we called an offering for a way forward. Okay. Okay. Thank you. And that I think followed the followed the statement of the bishops on Tuesday morning in response to I'm presuming it was um, response from people within your annual conferences the concerns that were raised by constituents. Um, um, although that wasn't specifically stated in there, I don't think, but it did note the anxiety that had been building, which led to that statement. And then later, I don't know if it was in the morning, the afternoon, this motion by Mark Holland that was um, discussed. Regarding. Yeah, I think you're referring to uh, the statement that I made on behalf of the council uh, the yes. day before, I when, believe on Tuesday morning, yes, when regarding Bishop the Pickerton. unity of the church, yes. uh, which by the way, uh, uh, just because I like to point this out, was uh, was a day, uh, I think the day after I received the gavel as became president of the Council of Bishops, no, but that's, that's neither here nor there. Um, the, the, uh, the statement that I issued uh, on behalf of the Council regarding the unity of the church did in fact grow out of the many concerns that were coming out of delegations um, uh, about whether we were on the cusp of schism. Uh, as you well know, all of you know, there was legislation um, before the general conference that would have um, moved us in that direction, uh, facilitated that, uh, so there was a great deal of concern. So first came the statement about um, um, our affirming our role as Council of Bishops to maintain the unity of the church, and I think that led to some of the subsequent discussion that you referred to. Yes, thank you. Yes, Bishop, stay where you are, please. I wasn't saved by the bell. So. No, not this time. If you could just restate for us again, as members of the council, your understanding and interpretation of what the council of bishops believe that the general conference empowered them to do in relationship to the way forward in the special session of the general conference. <clears throat> Our understanding is that the uh, action of the General Conference uh, specifically asked the Council of Bishops to, uh, to live into the report that we had brought called an offering for a way forward and all of the uh, specifics about that, which included very specific language about our willing, willingness to humbly accept the leadership responsibility that the General Conference was asking, which is quite, was unprecedented. We know it's unprecedented and then to implement the specific steps uh, that had been suggested, uh, which included, as I mentioned in my opening comments uh, earlier today, uh, to defer many of these items uh, for uh, future consideration, to um, ask the, the council to um, form a commission on a way forward, which was a suggestion of the Council of Bishops, 
uh, to call a special session if that seemed in order. Um, and, uh, and so our understanding is that um, we have implemented those steps in order to be prepared to fulfill what the General Conference asked us to do, which is to bring them uh, information, in this case what we've been talking about, a report that would um, sh say this is a way forward. Now, it's yours. You are the legislative body. We cannot, uh, we, we do not assume that power. Uh, it's not our power at all. We have simply given you back this work which you asked for. Uh, I have a question for Reverend Boyette and then one for either uh, Mr. Graves or Mr. George. You and others advocated for the position that anybody within the church should be able to file a petition by July the 8th uh, if, they think it, if they feel it's in harmony with the purpose of the call. Actually, so, I believe uh, that paragraph 14 and paragraph 507 permits anyone within the church to file a petition regardless of whether it's in harmony or not. That puts it, that puts it uh, before the general conference to determine whether it's in harmony or to determine whether it, it needs to take a two-thirds okay. vote. And then the, the, the session of the general conference can amend, reject, change, substitute, whatever it wants to do. Correct. By petition. And by motion. Okay. You're not going to know what's in this report or what the legislation is until it's too late to file a petition. How are you going to do that? Well, we, we know that the, the sorts of descriptions that have been made of the intent of each of these models, they've been widely discussed uh, both by the Council of Bishops and the Commission. And in addition, we know what uh, potential petitions for substitution can occur. Okay. Can you give me an example of a petition which you can think of today without having the report that the bishops are going to give you on, my, on July the 8th? Sure. For example, the uh, Connectional Conference Plan envisions various branches. Um, uh, it, it, may, it, may not, it may include a gracious exit provision. It may not include a gracious exit provision. A petition could put forward uh, a proposed gracious exit provision for churches that uh, elect not to participate in that process. That would be one example. Another example would be um, the church I pastored uh, put before the 2016 uh, General Conference a petition for amical separation and a petition for a commission to be established for amical separation. Both of those, I believe, would be appropriate petitions by way of substitution for the report. Okay, now I think everybody that has come to the podium so far agrees that the question of in harmony is for the general conference. That's correct. How is it going to determine that with your gracious uh, withdrawal petition, for example? Um, well, there have been several ways that have been suggested in the briefs, including the one that Bishop uh, Jones uh, referenced uh, the committee on reference. But that's within the prerogative of the general conference to determine the means by which it will determine whether something's in harmony or not. But I would submit that the petition is appropriate to be filed the very language of paragraph 14 assumes that petitions are going to be filed. Uh, why else would you require a two-thirds vote to entertain some business if it's not going to be there before the general conference? Well, I, I read that sentence to me when it says other business to be something entirely away from the question of human sexuality, yeah. ordaining gay pastors, or any of that sort of thing that we're here to talk about today. And, and, if, and if that's the way you read it, then I would maintain any petition on uh, matters of structure or substance uh, with respect to the conflict are in harmony and appropriate to be filed. Okay, but again, who makes that, how does that decision get made in St. Louis? It's made by the General Conference by its procedures, and one process that has been suggested is the Committee on Reference uh, making those determinations and submitting them to the body. Okay, well then let, let's let these two gentlemen come up here yes, sir. and maybe they can shed some light on this. <laughs> Mr. Boyette or someone's petition uh, on graceful exit arrives by July the 8th to the secretary. Is that where they go? It will be for this session. 
Where, what do you do with it? Moving into the realm of moot and hypothetical, which is not where I like to be, uh, and based on the precedent of this court. Well, courts uh, get to unusual. ask hypothetical questions. That's right. So, and so we're And we're I may going have some here. more, but go ahead and right. uh, In the case of a regular quadrennial session of the General Conference, and that is the session that I have operated as a petition secretary for over 20 years. The only boundaries that we have are the boundaries within the Book of Discipline and the rules, um, the plan of organization and rules of order. That is the framework within which petitions are measured for validity or for invalidity. If a petition is deemed to be invalid because it does not meet the rules that are set by the Book of Discipline and the plan of organization and rules of order, it is kept to the side on a list, and the committee on reference process that's been mentioned before has been to review those decisions. We'll assume this one is valid. If it this, is valid. This, this graceful exit petition is valid. If it assume is that. valid, then I think we are back to the element of who determines whether it is in harmony to the call. And, and I am looking to you as well as perhaps the rest of us uh, in the process to determine where that point is made. Who well, is the person who will decide we move it forward or we hold it? Well, I think but, we can probably define what is meant by harmony, but we can't make a factual decision as to whether his petition is in harmony. It meets that definition. Correct. So who's going to do it? In, in your organization or in the committee on the general conference or where? The process for the committee on reference, and I point us to um, lines 240 and following in the plan. Committee on reference in the regular quadrennial session has been called the day prior to the opening of general conference. We are in a session, uh, in a situation if you are to suggest that the committee on reference is to act in the interim from 16 moving into 2019, this process has not been invoked. And the committee on reference has reviewed the actions of the secretary and the petition secretary. That is their role, to review the actions. Therefore, I would hope that as you make the ruling, you determine who you are instructing to make that call. I don't have the answer for you. I will be looking for you to tell us. I have the exact same question, uh, as I'm sure you can imagine. Bishop Carter came last week to the Chancellor's Conference in Atlanta and, and gave a presentation about where he thought all this was going. And at some point in that discussion, I heard that there was going to be a committee of the whole instead of legislative committees. Do either one of you know anything about that? There has been speculation and dreaming and brainstorming about how we would function within a three-day period of time and still do it within the scope of the rules that are before us. According to paragraph 505, the rules of the 2016 General Conference as they were approved will be the rules that we enter 2019 and we will be following any scope of how to use those um, legislative committees in a different way, um, to use them as discussion groups, to involve the process of holy conferencing that was used um, in the two previous general conference agendas. Um, all of that has been discussed. None of that has been decided. Who decides it? The Commission on General Conference ultimately would be setting the agenda. Uh, and so if that is something that they would be considering, it would be an action of the Commission on General Conference. Uh, the collaboration between the Commission on the Way Forward, the Council of Bishops Leadership, and the Executive Committee of the Commission on the General Conference has been an ongoing conversation. Uh, it will continue to be an ongoing conversation. It will be informed by the decision that we will receive from this body and then we will begin to make some concrete plans. We have not been at a point where we felt we were able to do that until this question is resolved. Mr. George, do you assume that your commission will make these decisions in advance of us going to St. Louis? No, sir. I uh, want to reiterate what uh, 
Reverend Graves said, uh, commission essentially has a responsibility for implementation. It will look to this body primarily to be uh, guided uh, and then in its own process, defined by the Book of Discipline, will do its very best to implement what is presented to us. Commission has one more full meeting in October, and I believe, uh, ironically, before you meet for your October uh, session. Thank you. Well, let's just assume that this Judicial Council does not tell you how to do this, not tell you who's going to make the decision, but tells you you've got to decide what in harm if this petition of Reverend Boyette's is in harmony, then what? Who's going to do it? Mr. Plowden, my sense is that uh, we are a servant of the General Conference itself. Again, let me reiterate, we are an implementing body. Ultimately, constitutionally, the General Conference has that authority. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Microphone, Mr. Plowden's question represented that everyone that's come to the podium today agrees that the General Conference is the authority on whether something is in harmony or not. In our, that's not my position exactly, and there's an important distinction. I think it's a, he's asking a practical question, which is a very good question. If a petition is filed and it gets referred, at some point, somebody's going to have to decide whether it's in harmony. And our brief indicated, I believe in the reply brief, if not in the initial brief, we don't disagree that as a practical matter, um, various parties participating in the general conference will make a decision about whether something is in harmony or not. Ultimately, the harmony standard is a constitutional standard. And you all are the ultimate authority of whether something is in harmony or not provided it's appealed to you. So when a petition is filed, uh, Mr. Plowden, uh, if, if a petition is filed, um, that may move forward, and at some point, someone may bring to you a case of a particular provision. Your jurisdiction allows you to ha allows the uh, general conference, which would be a majority, or the council of bishops to seek a declaratory decision on any proposed legislation. So if a petition is filed, those are the bodies that can bring to you a concrete petition and ask you to decide whether it's in harmony or not. Council Member Reyes, I agree with your construction of that uh, provision, incidentally. What I think you can't do is adopt a rule in advance that says subject matter is synonymous with purpose. That denudes purpose of any significant meaning. Um, that doesn't honor what the General Conference was trying to do. But I completely agree that it's available to you all to say, I don't have a concrete petition in front of me. I can't say whether it's in harmony or not. I haven't seen the report yet. I haven't seen the recommendation in black and white. Once you get a petition, though, there will have to be people on the ground making a decision. It may be the presiding officer saying that's out of order. That may then be overruled by a majority of the General Conference. One-fifth of the general conference, <clears throat> if it gets on the floor, can then bring a, a request for a declaratory decision to you saying that was wrong. That's not what harmony means under the Constitution. These things can play out. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you. Uh, this brings to end this oral hearing. We want to thank you all for your participation, from your answers and your presentation, I think you have been liking the Judicial Council. We thank you for your service to the church. Will you a deal of gratitude? Thank you. This session is adjourned.